to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ no other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. Welcome to our series of lessons on the Church of Christ. As always, this program is brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. These Christians would love for you to stop by their assembly and visit with them. If you've got a Bible question or you'd like to learn more about God's truth, they'd be happy to talk with you about that. At the Gospel of Christ, we're also glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. And our hope is that these lessons will help each of us to draw closer to God and His will. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on DVD or CD or any of our lessons, you can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, or we'd be glad to ship those to you free of charge if you'll contact us at the information given during this program. And as always, if you'd like to study God's Word further, we'd love nothing more than to hear from you about the Bible study that you're interested in, and we'd be glad to talk to you about that. In this series of lessons, we're discussing the true nature of the Lord's Church. What is the Church of Christ in its nature really like? What are the fundamentals? What's its design? What makes it stand out as unique? And, and when we come to this book, the Bible, what do we really learn about the Lord's Church? This lesson specifically will talk about certain truths, identifying truths of the church that we find in the Bible. The first truth is the true founder of the Lord's church is Jesus Christ. Who founded, who started the church that you read about in the Bible? Well, if we were to look around in the denominational world, there might be a host of answers, but if we turn our attention to the Bible, we learn that Jesus started or founded His church. Again, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid. And the idea is, is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation of the Lord's church. He's the founder of it. Do you remember Matthew 16, verse 18? Only the true founder could say this. Jesus said to Peter, And I say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What did Jesus say He would do there? I'll build, I'll found my church, and hell won't even prevail against it. You see, Jesus is that interlocking stone that the Jews had left out. Acts 4 verses 11 and 12, Peter said to the Jews there, this is the chief cornerstone, this Jesus is the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other name other than the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about the church, let's realize Jesus is the one true founder of His church. In making application to this idea, it's very important that we realize if the church that one is a part of, if the denomination or religious group that one is a part of wasn't started by Jesus, then friend, we say in all kindness, it cannot be the church you read about in this book. Now, let's illustrate that just from some simple facts. We want to show when it is that various religions were founded and who they were founded by to illustrate the importance of 
following God's teaching concerning the church as it relates to the various founders of religious organizations. And again, we say this just simply for factual analysis. You can look to any denominational handbook. You can look to Mead's denominational handbook and it will tell you when these started. For example, if the church Jesus founded started in the book of Acts by Jesus, when did some of our modern religious groups start? Well, notice this chart that illustrates that idea. For example, the Lutheran Church. Who founded it? Martin Luther. What about the Mennonite Church? It was founded by Menno Simmons. What about Calvinism? Founded by John Calvin. What about the Presbyterian Church? John Knox. What about the Baptist Church? founded by John Smith. Methodist was founded by John Wesley and of course the Mormon Church founded again by Joseph Smith. We say that simply to say that modern religious groups, denominations that exist today, clearly recognize they were founded by Jesus upon His principle. And so what's the first truth we learn? Jesus is the sole founder and if the religious group I'm a part of doesn't go all the way back to Christ in its origin, it cannot be the church that you read about in the New Testament. A second truth that we learn about the Lord's church is the time period in which it began. We ask the question, when was the New Testament church founded? If Jesus started the church, the church, the second truth we learn is, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ began in the first century. Now, take your mind back to Daniel chapter 2. A great prophecy occurs here. You've got four kingdoms, the, the Babylonians, the Greek, the Medo-Persian, and the Roman kingdom. Daniel prophesies that during the time of these four kingdoms, God in heaven will set up a kingdom, a new kingdom, which will never be destroyed. Now, during the time of the Babylonians, God is still reigning through Israel. During the time of the Greeks and the Medo-Persians, God is still reigning through the kingdom of Israel. Israel is still in existence. But then you come to that fourth time period, the Roman era, and something unique happens. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, to His disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some of you standing here today, listen, who will not taste death until you see the kingdom present with power. Something happened in the first century. What was that? Well, friend, Jesus promised and prophesied his kingdom would be established. Remember Matthew 16, 18? Jesus said, I'll build my church. Verse 19, the very next words are, Jesus said to Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. What's the church? The kingdom. What's the kingdom? The church. When the church came into existence. During that Roman period, that time period of that fourth kingdom, God promised and fulfilled He would set up a new kingdom during the first century. Did that happen? You bet it did. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, the Apostle Paul said to Christians that God was transferring some out of darkness presently into the kingdom of His dear Son. Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, Paul was preaching the kingdom of God as a present reality. And so I know who founded the church. Jesus Christ. I know based off the prophecy of Daniel and the fulfillment in the New Testament when the Lord's church started. It started in the first century. It started in Acts chapter 2 when men and women were added to the church by God. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Now friend, if it's the case that the church of the Bible, the church of Christ, started in the first century, we must again, for factual purposes, ask, when did most modern religious groups start? Again, we direct your attention to this chart recognizing when they started. For example, the Lutheran Church has as its starting date 1517. Mennonites, 1525. Calvinism, 
1536, the Presbyterian Church, 1560, the Baptist Church, 1605, Methodist, 1739, and you could go on down the list. What's the problem with all those dates? Here's the problem. They're all 1,500 plus years way too late. Friend, the Lord's church started in the New Testament. Not the year 1,500, 1,600, 1,700. Those weren't started by Jesus. His church that you read about in the book of Acts started in the first century. And so by application, again we ask, if one is a part of a religious group that was started 1,500 years too late, can it really be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now let's direct our attention to a third truth about the Lord's church. We can know from the New Testament that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was founded in Jerusalem. I already know who founded it, Jesus. I know when that time period was during that Roman kingdom in Acts chapter 2. Does the Bible tell us where the church would start? And friend, it absolutely does. I direct your attention to Isaiah chapter 2, and I want you to notice this prophecy that Isaiah makes about the new kingdom, the house of the Lord, that would be established and where it was going to be established. Listen to Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, same idea. House of the Lord is going to be established. God's kingdom is going to be set up. It's going to go forth and be have its beginning in Jerusalem. Now, friend, is it the case that that fourth kingdom, that during the fourth Roman era, that new kingdom that Jesus built, is it the case that it started in Jerusalem? It absolutely is. We open our Bible to Acts chapter 2. They're all assembled in Jerusalem as Jesus told them to in Luke 24. Wait in Jerusalem till you receive spirit, power from the Spirit on high. They're assembled there. And in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes upon them. They stand up. Peter stands up with the eleven for the very first time. Preaches salvation in the name of Jesus. You can obey the gospel, repent, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38 Those who gladly received His word, the Bible tells us, were baptized. Acts 2 verse 41 and 42. And listen to this. In Jerusalem, during the Roman period, founded by Jesus, the Bible says, and the Lord added to the church for the very first time those who were being saved. Acts 2 verse 47. Now friend, if the Bible identifies where the church was going to start, I want to be a part of that church that you read about in the Bible. I want to be part of the church that Jesus Himself set up. And so again, we simply ask the question, where did most religious groups begin? Again, we direct your attention just simply to these facts. The Methodist Church had its beginning in England. The Dutch Reformed in the Netherlands. Baptist churches were founded in Holland. Calvinism in, in Switzerland, Lutheran church in, in Germany. Friend, if they're 1,500 plus years too late, and if they're thousands of miles from Jerusalem, the very simple and basic question is, how can they be? How can they be the church I read about in the Bible if they don't fit these truths, if they're not followed by, thus saith the Lord, in the who, the when, and the where of the, where they were set up at. And again, 
We don't say these things to be unkind. We're not trying to hurt people's feelings. That's, that's the last thing we're trying to do. Friend, we're in the business. The gospel is all about saving souls. We want men and women to know that, that denominationalism is not in line with the will of God and that you can know the truth, you can know about the church Jesus built, that it does exist today, and that it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's now direct our attention to a, a fourth truth that we learn about the Lord's church, and it's this. The church of the New Testament must be called by biblical descriptions or names. What name does the New Testament church wear? Well, let's just think about some of these passages. Romans chapter 16, verse 16. The Scripture says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Is the name Church of Christ a biblical name? It absolutely is. We find it in Romans 16, verse 16. Does it honor the, the founder, the builder, and the one who purchased the church? You bet it does. Well, we also learn that along with the name Church of Christ, it is called the Church of God. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he says to the Church of God, which is at Corinth. And so when we think about the name Church of God, does that honor the master mind behind the plan, God behind the plan? Does it honor God and His Son? Does it honor the founder? You bet it does. God and Jesus Christ, Him being deity, it honors both of them. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, it is called the, the church of the firstborn. Colossians 1, verses 15 following teaches us that Jesus is that firstborn from the dead. It is the house of God. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, Paul said, These things I write to you shortly. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. House of God, church of the living God, all those are descriptions that honor God and honor His Son, the one who founded it, Jesus Christ. Now, someone may be thinking, well, that's all good and well, but is there really anything in a name? Friend, I know there is, for the Bible teaches that by principle, and we learn that based on common sense. For example, in the Bible, God actually changed people's names. Saul of Tarsus, now you're going to be called Paul went from bad to good. God changed His name. Now, we understand that. Uh, how many people do you know that would like to wear the name Jezebel or Judas or Adolf? Names carry a connotation. Descriptions show ownership or some similarity or likeness. And friend, if the Bible gives descriptions, if we're going to go by the Bible, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, don't add to that which is written. Don't go beyond that which is written. If we're going to follow Bible authority, then we've got to call the church by the descriptions God calls it. Now, friend, again, just for factual purposes, just to show the difference, notice again this chart which illustrates the variance in names that you don't find in the Bible. Friend, we ask in all kindness, where do you find the Lutheran Church in the Bible? Where do you find? If I, if I flip through the pages of my Bible, where do I find the Mennonite Church or the Presbyterian Church? If I read my Bible from Genesis 1-1 to the very last word of Revelation 22, where do I find a, a Baptist or a Methodist Church? And do those names pay honor to the one who built and founded the church? Friend, the answer is you can't find them there. And they don't honor the one who founded and built the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
A fifth truth that we learn about the Lord's church is its purpose. The purpose of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to bring honor and magnify the name of Almighty God. Ephesians 3 verses 10 and 11, the Bible says to the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church. Ephesians 3 verse 20 and 21, the, the church is to bring honor to God. God. To God be glory in the church. What's the church all about? Friend, it's not a social club. It's not a, a place where you can go to mingle. It's not a place where you go to be entertained or a place where you go to be served. The church is about glorifying God by serving Him. What's the mission and purpose of the church? It's to take the whole gospel to the whole world. To the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God might be known to principalities and powers and those in heavenly places by the church. The church has the awesome purpose and mission of spreading the gospel, of glorifying God in everything that it says and does. Luke chapter 19 verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's the mission of the church. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus gave us marching orders when He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, We're called out of darkness to serve Him. We're a, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, to proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. What's the church and, and members of the body? What is their mission? to proclaim God's goodness, His mercy, and His love to a lost and dying world. The church is not about hosting functions. It's not about throwing pizza parties. It's not about all the entertainment ideas that so many times we get caught up in. The church has that mission of spreading the gospel to the lost. A sixth truth that we learn about the Lord's church is the church must be organized according to the Bible. Friend, think about this. Do you find in the Bible a papacy, meaning one pope who rules over all men? Do you find a, a priesthood where we bow down and call someone father? Now Jesus said, call no man father, Matthew 23, 9. Do we find a, a, a board of deacons or a one-man pastor system in the Bible? It's not what you find. Philippians 1, 1. To all the saints with the bishop and deacons who are at Philippi. What do we have in the Lord's church? We've got Christ as the head. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. We have bishops, or another word is elders or overseers in the Lord's church. And then we have deacons. 1 Timothy 3, there are qualifications for elders, and there are always a plurality, and there are qualifications for deacons, and there are a plurality. Deacons serve under elders. We're all Christians. Here's what you don't find. There's no clergy laity system. There's no hierarchy. There's no big me and little you in the Lord's church. It's not the way it works. All men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. That's the organization of the Lord's church. And again, we mentioned you don't find a pastor, you don't find a pope, you don't find a board, of, you just don't find those things in the New Testament. Then, as we think about the Lord's church, we ask the question, how many churches did Jesus build? A seventh truth is, Jesus just built one church. Friend, did you know that the Bible says Jesus only intended to build one church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, God put all things under His feet, Jesus' feet, gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. And so the church and the body in the Bible are synonyms. Now, how many bodies are there? Ephesians 4, verse 4, one Lord, one faith, one body. If the church is the body, and the Bible says there's only one body, how many churches are there? Just one. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20, There are many members, yet but one body. Colossians 3, verse 15, You were called into one body, and be ye thankful. Over and over again. Romans 12, a host of other places. We find that there is just one 
body. Another truth that we learn about the Lord's church is it is essential. Friend, listen very carefully. When we think about a truth concerning the church that so many people miss out on, the church is essential to being saved. Here's why. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, Salvation is in Christ. How do you get into Christ? You're baptized into Christ. When you're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, you're added to the body. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. If it is the body of Christ that's going to be saved, then salvation in Christ, in the church, is essential. Hebrews chapter 12. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, listen, whose names are registered in heaven. Whose names are registered in heaven? Those in the church. If I'm not in the church, my name's not registered. And probably one of the clearest of all is 1 Corinthians 15, 24. The Bible says that when Jesus returns, He is going to take those in the kingdom He's going to deliver the kingdom to the Father. Remember, the kingdom's the church. Matthew 16, 18, and 19. If at the second coming, Jesus is going to take the kingdom, representing those in the kingdom, to the Father. And friend, if I want to go to the Father, I've got to be in the Lord's church. We then ask this. How is one added to the New Testament church? Well, very simply, by obeying God's Plan of salvation. What is that plan of salvation? Men and women must hear the Word. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Acts 18, 8. They heard the message. Then they had to believe in Jesus. Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 42. In that context, you've got the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and they're going down the road. Here's water. What doth hinder me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Then a person must repent. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. You must make the good confession. Romans 10, verse 10. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And friend, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. To get into the Lord's church where all the saved are, where forgiveness of sins is, or you must be baptized. How do we know that? By one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13. Friend, we ask you kindly today, are you a member of the church in this book? Are you a member of the New Testament church? If not, we beg you to become one before it's everlastingly too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.